In this video, we're going to discuss the edge of human knowledge on the quantum mechanical world. It all comes down to the two-slit experiment. Uh, you'll find attached in the course links to a couple other videos, at least one that can depict the images of this a little bit better. Um, the two-slit experiment is a wonderful proof of concept or perhaps extreme confusion that is quantum mechanics. To put it lightly, we understand waves pretty darn well in things like water. If you have water, there'll be kind of a wave on the ocean, and we'll say, hey, here's a bunch of waves on the water, and they move forward towards the beach. They just move this direction. Well, if you have a harbor, and you have some seawalls, eventually those waves will hit the seawall. Now the edges will bounce back, but some of this will pass through. And curiously enough, when it comes out the other side, it doesn't just keep going straight. You don't get one wave that goes straight in one direction. They spread out. They radiate. Chuck a pebble, pebble forward in the water. It'll splash, but you'll see waves go out in all directions. It doesn't just go forward. Energy gets spread out in different directions as it passes to all the molecules, and bit by bit, as one water molecule kind of moves forward and hydrogen bonds drag the other molecules around it, it spreads that energy out. And your wave over time expands and expands as it goes. It just keeps spreading out, getting weaker and weaker and weaker. Well, if you have a wall on this side, you can say, hey, it hit here, and a little way later as the wave keeps spreading out, eventually it'll hit here, and as it keeps spreading out, it'll hit here. Your wave will end up sloshing against the whole surface. Now, curious thing, if you have two slits, so let's redo this experiment. This time I have an in and an out side of my seawall. So when the wave hits, some of it on, that hits the wall bounces back into the ocean, but the parts that don't, they pass through. And they start to radiate. Well, eventually they radiate on top of each other. Well, if you have two waves, they can either constructively interact, where your real wave is the sum of the two waves in an amplification, or they can destructively interact, where your real wave becomes something else as they start to cancel out. Now, depending on how overlapped you are with each other, These can either line up pretty darn well or largely cancel each other. Depending if you are in phase or out of phase with one another, you will be amplifying or neutralizing the intensity. At different points on the wall, as they reach across to reach the wall, at some points they will cross and they will be in phase. We'll do pink for in phase and green for out of phase. But then they'll be out of phase for a little while until they're severely in phase again, and then they'll be out of phase for a little while, and then they'll be in phase again. As these two waves meet, they'll move in and out of being in phase or out of phase. Because the angles to each point are different. What makes these line up as in phase or out of phase is as one goes one direction and the other goes the other. A little off on the drawing here, but if they are equal distance to the wavelength, if they line up in their travel so that they're both at the same height upon impact there, they'll be in phase. But this wall doesn't have to go as far to reach here as the second slit has to go to reach there. 
because of the angle difference, they will travel a slightly different distance. So one of these might be at the peak right there. And here this one is also at the peak, where if I am going to some other location, I might be at the midpoint for this one, and I might be at the bottom when this one reaches there. Because of the differences in distance you travel, you'll be somewhere along your wavelength. Remember, peak to peak is one wavelength. If you have to travel a little farther, you might be a little farther past your wavelength than if you traveled a little shorter. As a result, how they line up on this wall changes whether they are in phase or out of phase. And that result is only in phase has a peak. Well, if this is light instead of water, you can have a detector. So you set up a detector. Something that will pick up a photon hitting it. And what you will find is that you only get absorptions where they are in phase. If they are severely out of phase, you get no absorption. The photon never hits. Over time, if you kind of have a detector window, what you'll see is you'll see an intense spot here and here and here. And there's a bit of percentage amplified. The further away you get, it gets a little weaker. But you will only get absorptions in what we call a diffraction pattern. The light is skipping those dark spots in the middle because they're out of phase with each other. The detector looks like nothing's there. And so nothing ever hits. The detector, however, where they are in phase, sees the energy and says, oh yeah, I, I've got photons here. I can absorb them. And so we get signals from the detectors that are where the phases line up constructively. Now, this is part of how we justified light was a wave. It split apart and gave interference patterns. We see this in water. If you ever drop two stones into water, you can see their ripples interact. If you've ever been on the water and wakes of two boat pass through you, depending on how they hit, you might get tossed all around. If they're constructively interacting, you might kind of just barely feel little bumps if they're destructively interacting. Well, this is great for photons, but the odd thing is we saw this even when we set up lasers, really powerful lasers, and were able to shoot one photon at a time. When one photon got up, truth is it's a little bit bigger, it actually seems to pass through both at once and interfere with itself because that one photon will hit one spot. And then we shoot a second photon, it's here, and a third photon, and a fourth photon, and a fifth, and a sixth, and a seventh, and an eighth, and a ninth, and a tenth, and an eleventh, and a twelfth, and a thirteenth. And if we do it long enough, we find that they only hit those spots. Despite being a single photon, it still diffracts. It still interferes just like we had a mass of them. What's really curious is when we did this with electrons. An electron, well, we think of it as a particle. It ought to just pass right through. If you think of an hourglass, you've got a bunch of sand up here. It falls straight down. Makes a little pile, but it makes one center point. Even if you had an hourglass that oddly had two openings. You'd expect to just get two piles. This is what we think of for particles. They fall straight down. However, what we saw with the electron is exactly the same. Whether a photon or an electron, when you pass through the two slits, you get an interference pattern which means somehow the mass-containing physical object of the electron was acting like the photon and interfering with itself. 
whether this is a beam of lots of electrons or one at a time, you get exactly the same pattern. Additionally, if you do this with larger molecules, hydrogen atoms, helium atoms, up to several hundred grams per mole biomolecules, you get this same interference pattern. This tells us two very odd things. One, the particle always hits in only one spot. If you only shoot one, you see it show up in one location. But the locations that it can show up in, if you just keep shooting them over time, only match the locations that could be reached by a wave. So our particles are definitely impacting in one location like a particle, but they are moving to positions that can only be dictated by a wave. This is particle wave duality. And this is the thing that we still don't understand. If you ever want to win a Nobel Prize, explain this one. But it led, led us to a lot of interesting conclusions about quantum mechanics, about waves at the smallest level of reality. It's done a lot for electronics and other things, and it will lead us into de Broglie's calculations in our next video. To put it simply, the particle will interact as a particle with something when it hits it, but it exists as a wave until it hits it. It seems to do both. It's a very odd concept, and well, I'd love to give you a better explanation. That's the end of it. We don't have the next step in this explanation. It does, however, help us do a lot of things like calculate out the wavelength of an electron for using an electron microscope, as I said we'll see when we do De Broglie in the next video. So this is the two-slit experiment. If you want a little bit more, I highly recommend watching the videos attached with this section.